In the early 50s, there's a woman named Dorothy Martin who believed that she was getting messages directly from aliens from a planet called Clarion. And they were telling her, among other things, that a massive flood, a huge tsunami wave was going to wipe out life on the planet. It was going to specifically wipe out life just before the break of dawn on December 21st, 1954. Very specific. She begins to grow a following. Now, as that date is getting closer, right, as midnight's ticking down, all of these followers are gathered and they're awaiting the spaceship's arrival. It's according to Dorothy. It's supposed to land at that location and pick them up at midnight. And as that clock is ticking down, you have to put yourself in their shoes. These are people that aren't just like, oh, hey, it'd be fun to go for a spaceship ride. It goes far deeper than that. For months or years in some cases, these people had gone all in on this belief system. They had quit their jobs. They had sold their belongings, sold their houses. They had cut off, burned bridges with very deep family, friend, coworker relationships. I mean, you can imagine how hard it would be to watch someone you love fall into something like this and the tension that could cause in the relationship. A lot of these people destroyed those relationships. So financially, socially, emotionally, metaphysically, spiritually, professionally, everything about their lives has been poured into into and committed to this idea that on December 21st, I am going to go to the planet Clarion with these aliens and escape the destruction that's about to occur. Midnight ticks by and, you know, spoiler alert, nothing happens, right? The world was not destroyed in the early 50s by a massive wave. 1205 ticks by. And at one point, one of the followers notices that, well, this clock says 1205, but the clock in this room says 1155. So they start having this discussion where, well, maybe no, maybe that clock's fast. So maybe it's 1155, but that clock ticks up to midnight and it ticks past midnight. And every minute that ticks by, the room gets quieter and quieter. What had been a very excited, jittery, conversational, lively, celebratory atmosphere becomes a, a little more solemn. People start crying. People start trying to figure out what's happening because you don't just in this situation go, oh, guess we were wrong. Well, you know, let's go bowling tomorrow. I mean, remember how much of these people's lives have been poured into this prediction. As it ticks closer and closer past two, three, four in the morning, people start becoming desperate for an explanation. Dorothy receives, surprise, another transmission. And she says, you know what? It turns out because we all huddle together so tightly and spread this light across the world, God and the aliens, whatever, decided to spare the world. And we've saved the world. Congratulations. And also, they're going to pick us up now on Christmas Eve, December 24th. You would think the average person, once that doomsday date ticks by and nothing happens, would go, oh, this is a lie. But people don't do that. Some people did, but a lot of people doubled down on this lie. They came even more fervent. Christmas Eve, when the spaceship was supposed to pick them up, they gathered this crowd of onlookers, media, random people, kind of gawking and, 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 and spectating as they all chanted Christmas carols and welcomed the aliens uh, from this planet. And again, of course, nothing happened. And this is not uncommon with doomsday cults. What happens to these people? A lot of times, they not just they don't just fall away they fall deeper into it they become more committed what draws normal people like you and me into these belief systems to begin with and then what keeps them there long past their expiration date or long past the point when any neutral observer could see something is not right here something unhealthy is going on we're going to talk about that. What are the five most common traits that cult leaders use to recruit and maintain members as they grow their beliefs and they grow their community? Number one, cults tend to offer a very simple explanation for all of your problems. Obviously, that's snake oil, right? There's nothing cures everything. One simple thing doesn't cure everything. There's there's no magic bullet out there, whether it's the medical field or in economics or in or in, in sociology. There's a, we live in a complex world with a lot of complex things that drive the machinations of that world. Well, that can be frustrating. 
right? If you want to know why did I lose my job? Why did someone I love get sick and die? You know, these are really hard questions and these are really hard answers. A lot of times there maybe isn't an answer. The universe is indifferent or the answer is beyond our understanding is a common response to these things. Especially when it comes to economic stuff though, like, you know, why did you lose your job? The answer is probably a combination of a web of different factors, trade, economic policies, tariffs, taxes, uh, the flow of, of labor pools uh, and uh, the supply and demand of labor, supply and demand of whatever your product or service was. This is something that does not have an easy answer, but you do want an answer. So you have a couple options. One, go get a PhD in economics and figure out why the market crashed. Or two, someone walks up to you and says, hey, uh, the reason that all bad things in the world happen are because you have evil things called thetans in you. And that's where all of your sadness comes from, or that's where all negative thoughts come from. Or, or hey, you know what? Yeah, the world is, is going to hell. The world is collapsing in on itself. And furthermore, a wave will come wash the world away on December 21st. But I can tell you, I know why it's happening. I have direct communication from these aliens and I can save you from it. So they give you a very simple explanation or a very simple prediction about the world. And, and there's comfort in that, right? You, when you, uh, one of the hardest things about suffering is not knowing why you're suffering, not knowing what the larger purpose is or if there is a larger purpose. And a lot of times believing that there's a larger purpose or believing that you understand why it happened. It scratches an itch. If there is a level of satisfaction or comfort, I guess is a better word, pacification that comes from having someone tell you the world is not as scary, unpredictable, and indifferent as you might think it is. What happened to you is horrible, but here's exactly why it happened, right? They knowing, understanding that cause and effect process is something that quells a lot of anxieties and fears that are a natural response to the otherwise chaotic, disinterested agony that can come at you from at randomly when you're least expecting it in the world. Number two, a lot of these groups provide people with an entirely new identity that comes packaged with this salvation. It's interesting how much even things like symbols can change our identity. You probably probably have heard of the Stanford prison experiment. They randomly selected you know, a bunch of Stanford students. Half of them got randomly put into the prisoner pool. Half were randomly put into the officer, police officer pool. And they ran a mock prison. The prisoners had to stay overnight for days and days and days. The police officers got to go home. And what was crazy was they fell into their roles relatively quickly, right? The, the prisoners became kind of subservient, took up, put up with a lot of abuse that they didn't have to put up with, but they got in their minds, they became kind of trapped in, in this prisoner mentality. The police officers, the, again, these are just students, but they became physically and emotionally and verbally abusive to their other, their classmates. A big chunk people think of, of this transformation of identity comes with the wearing of uniforms. The prisoners were made to change out of their normal clothes into prisoner uniforms. They were referred to by a number, not a name. The police officers wore police officer, officer uniforms, and they were referred to by a title, officer so-and-so, right? So a uniform, a new name, these are really crucial aspects of shifting someone's identity. This is not unique to prisoners or police officers. You see this in, in entertainment, right? People that are incredible entertainers, they go on stage and they're kind of somebody else. You ever hear of someone that's kind of like soft-spoken and shy in interviews, but then when you see them on stage, they go under it like Lady Gaga, right? They go under another name. They're somebody different. Their identity shifts. They're in costume. And we see this in cults, in a lot of these extremist religious groups as well, right? When you convert, when you become officially a member of the fold, fully initiated, oftentimes that comes with a brand new title, a brand new name. Um, it oftentimes also comes with a, a uniform. So this new identity creates a break, a shift in, in continuity between their past self and their new self, right? They're reborn into a new role, and it kind of makes it easier to change and massage and manipulate their personality characteristics and their behavior going forward. Number three, isolation. This is a huge one. It doesn't happen all at once, but slowly a recruit will become more and more isolated over time. 
What this does is it makes the cult members, the community and the leadership, the only source of information about the reality that this person lives in. You know, you isolate someone, their, all their information about what's happening in the world around them is coming from really one person, usually that one central cult leader. This allows the cult to shape the member's reality. And I cannot stress how literal this is. I mean, it shapes not just their cognitive reality, but how they perceive even sometimes the physical reality around them. What does that look like when your reality is shaped by the people around you? This is not as foreign a concept as it might seem. An example is the Ash Conformity Experiment. Very famous example, Solomon Ash. He took eight people, put them in a room, and asked them to solve very simple questions like, like this one. Right? So the line on the left is a certain length. Which of the three options on the right is the same length? Pretty simple answer. In this case, it's C. People answered this correctly over 99% of the time in all the control trials. The thing that the participants were not aware of is that out of this group of eight people, only one of them was actually a subject. Everyone else, the other seven were research assistants or, or actors. And so they were told that, you know, after the third or so time that I asked you one of these questions, from that time on, for the next 15 trials, uh, give the wrong answer. And they were, it was scripted. So they would give them a, a prompt like this and, and they go, okay, uh, which one is the similar length? And everyone around them would go, B, B, B. As you're going around this circle and the research is like very good and he's writing down these answers. And as they're working their way around the circle, the person that's the actual subject is like, well, B? Like, <laughs> and they're looking back at it and they're like, I gotta, it's C, right? Am I crazy? Am I going nuts? And they would start sweating bullets. And by the time it got to them, not all of them, about a third of them, a little more than a third, like, you know, almost 40% of them um, said that it was B. They, they went with the crowd. And this is how strong conformity is with surrounded by seven other strangers, not a huge group, people that mean nothing to you. They are not your sole source of social support or financial support or spiritual support. They're not your family, your friends. They mean nothing to you. In that short amount of time, that's the effect it has. Now imagine what that number, that percentage rises to when it becomes a community that is you're isolated with. They're everything to you. And you can see how if people literally physically can convince themselves that a physiological stimulus vision is different or warped based on the opinion of people around them, imagine what this can do to your larger sense of the world. It also prevents criticism, right? No one's challenging these beliefs. This is not, these are not environments where people can raise their hands and go, oh, yes, leader, but what about this? Or if you say this, then how come this? Dissent is not tolerated in these environments. You are excommunicated, you are banished, right? Or you are pummeled into submission. And so when you control the world around someone, you control the information flow, you control their reality, you prevent criticism, and you increase reliance on that person. If you grew up in a small town, it's hard to leave that small town. There's a whole lot out there. There's a whole lot for you to do. There's, there's all kinds of opportunity and potential, but everything you've known, your, your coach, you know, your teachers, your, your family, your, your friends, everything you've known is in that small town. It can feel like it's physiologically a piece of you. So to leave feels like you're amputating something. It's very scary. It's terrifying. Now, crank that up to 11 when it comes to these cults. Everything about them, the, the people that their romantic partner, um, oftentimes their children, sometimes their extended family, their best friends, every, every relationship and support network they have is tied to this cult. If you are isolated and the only people you commune with are this group, then it dramatically increases your reliance on that group. You can't just shift to a new group of friends because this one got weird. You've got no other group of friends. Oftentimes part of that isolation means damaging, breaking, violently severing the ties to your friends and family around you and coworkers, people that are concerned about you. There may not be an external support network left outside for people to fall back on if they want to escape this increasingly toxic cult environment. Number four, the cult promotes a very binary view of the world around them, right? There is good and evil. There's, there's sin and there's redemption, purity. And 
a lot of times the gatekeeper to that redemption or the gatekeeper to that good or that purity is the cult leader. What is purity? What is good? Good can be a polygamous lifestyle. It can be a monogamous lifestyle. And what determines that? It's not a blood test. It's not a scientific test. It's what does your leader say? You know, good can be wearing a dress of a certain length. Good can be wearing coveralls of a certain thickness. I mean, a lot of these rules get very arbitrary, but they are all determined and can be changed at any given time by that one central authority, that one leader of this group. When the world becomes that black and white, you sort of wind up in this philosophy that automatically extinguishes dissent. Right. Either you agree with this person and you are going to go to heaven or be raptured up to the planet Clarion or whatever it is, or you're one of them. Right. You're the, you're the, the out group. This drive to attain that redemption or, or purity, again, makes you, number one, more reliant on the leader. Number two, very intolerant of criticism, even internally policing yourself when you start doubting things. And number three, vilifies the people outside. And who, if, if there's any threat to the leader, if there's any threat to the cult membership, where's it going to come from? Likely outside, friends and family. So if you can be isolated and the cult leader can convince you that just by the basic fact that they are not under the larger grace and light of this cult leader, that they are now by default evil or wayward or astray, that that makes them not worth interacting with or makes them threatening to you independently. Number five, confession. So a really famous example of Scientology, a big chunk of the onboarding process is you go through these deep interviews with more established members of, of the, the church. And you talk about everything that you've done that you're not proud of, everything that they would identify as the equivalent of sinful behavior. It emphasizes that distinction between sin and purity. It also consolidates the power of the leader because again, that leader always plays a central role in absolving you of those impurities. And then lastly, and this isn't always the case, but oftentimes it seems it is, it's blackmail, right? They have a list of everything you have done in your life. And if you ever start to fall out of line, this can be incredibly effective leverage against you, either to keep you in the group, keep you in the fold, or if you leave eventually to keep you from talking about how that cult works or going to the authorities. It's kind of like a meta metaphysical NDA. So those are the top five things that we see in every cult. It's not just cults that use these. And probably at this point, you can see that, right? That this is something that, that a lot of different types of people and different types of organizations throughout history have used to manipulate and control people, remove their sense of self-agency and their sense of, of, of autonomy over themselves, their behavior, their thoughts. And when you start doing that, when you start getting a power differential that is that dramatic, it's just almost an inevitable recipe for abuse at some point. You know, someone has that much power over someone else. It, it really dark stuff starts to happen really quick. So it's worth being able to identify these traits in whether it's not even just a, a you know, a theological group you belong to, but a, a relationship you're in, you know, romantically, uh, platonically, professionally with an employer. You know, it's, it's, it can be hard sometimes to put your finger on what is off about a new club that someone joined or, or a new relationship or a new interaction that someone's having, a new group of friends, like something's not right. You can't put your finger on it, but it seems wrong. This can kind of give you a framework to go, oh yeah, no, like th this is isolation. Right? It's gradual isolation, or this is centralized power in a group, right? Like the centralized power of, the, of the, the role that the cult leader plays in absolving your sins or defining good versus evil. So if you can kind of keep these ideas floating around, they can be sometimes easier to identify very quickly and to verbalize them to people when you have that window to approach them and say, yeah, I'm worried about you. Usually it's worth noting, logic does not work when you're trying to pull someone out of a cult. Uh, it wasn't logic that got them there in the first place. So yes, it's, it's more about asking yourself, what are they getting? 
are they getting a sense of belonging? Are they getting a sense of calm and order to the world? Are they coming out of a tragic, traumatic experience and there's something soothing and pacifying about this simple worldview? Does it give them a sense of self-importance? If I'm the one person that has a direct line to a larger power, it, it does make them maybe more special and more chosen and more valuable than the average person that is not in that situation. What is it that this person is getting out of this group or these relationships? And is there something else that they could get that need met through, whether it's you or a different group that they could get involved in that's a little healthier? So it's it's about replacing like Indiana Jones, right? Replacing the idol with that bag of sand. It's about finding what is keeping them in this group, what's so reinforcing about this group and directing them to find that but find it somewhere else. That's it. All right. I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, let me know, you know. Leave a comment if you have any questions or you have ideas for, you know, videos or topics in psychology and sociology I could maybe do later on. And have a good day.